thank you so much. Everybody has been uh, so terribly obedient in terms of maintaining your time, which is good because we want to get to Q&A and dialogue. Alexander Maine, we sure certainly will follow course. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Alex Main from the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Uh, so as the name of my organization does not really suggest, uh, we actually do a lot of work on Haiti, and we have done uh, since uh, the earthquake. We've been monitoring uh, the reconstruction efforts closely, also uh, political and social developments in the country. Um, and uh, we have the honor now of being often called a watchdog group uh, in the press, which is rather new for us. Uh, if you get a chance, we have um, some of our uh, articles out on the table, um, and you can consult our blog, uh, where we regularly uh, post updates on the reconstruction situation at www.cepr.net. Uh, and I'd like to start off by thanking uh, the co-sponsors uh, of this uh, event. Um, I'm really glad that the Congressional Black Caucus uh, is keeping uh, Haiti on the radar. Um, because, of course, the situation remains quite dramatic uh, there. So I'd like to thank Representative Connors, Representative Wilson, uh, and the organizers, Cynthia and Mike, uh, for organizing this great panel. Um, there's some tough acts to follow, but I'm going to try to do my best. I want to talk about um, accountability, uh, sort of the overarching theme here, I think, of a lot of the presentations. Um, and so I want to focus on uh, the accountability of the international community of the U.S., uh, and international institutions um, around both the provision of aid and um, around the actions of the new stuff. And so, first of all, I'd like to make uh, a rather sad observation, and I think it comes across in some of the last few um, presentations that we've had, which is that we're um, in a very similar situation right now to what we were describing about a year ago on a similar panel uh, at the CPC uh, conference. Um, we still have hundreds of thousands of people in tents. Uh, we have um, really scant sign of uh, effective reconstruction. I mean, yes, there are some buildings going up, um, hotels in particular. Um, however, there's very little permanent housing. Now, housing should really be the priority uh, at this point uh, in Haiti. Uh, we're seeing very little. Um, the last um, statistics, and statistics are hard to come by uh, at times for permanent housing, um, there have been about 5,000 homes built, uh, which is, of course, far beneath the current demand for housing in the country. Um, so I think there have been some misplaced priorities as well. A lot of transitional shelters have been built. Uh, some $500 million have gone into transitional shelters. Uh, and, of course, these are not made to last. Um, and Representative Conyers is the Senator the Rose. Among the other things that we see, of course, is cholera that we saw described. The cholera situation remains dire. Um, and uh, um, one issue as well is agriculture. Of course, agriculture is absolutely vital to Haiti. We're not seeing the levels of production yet that we saw before uh, the earthquake. And already the levels were very low at that point. And of course, with Tropical Storm Isaac, the situation has grown much worse. We have an estimated $240 million of damage that was done. Um, and primarily in rural areas to um, a, a lot of farms. Um, so what's rather disheartening, I think, uh, is that we often see from aid authorities, we see a rather shiny, happy picture that's presented um, where uh, they talk about the reduction in uh, the numbers of IDPs when, in fact, there is no real tracking mechanism in place to see where a lot of these people are going. Uh, so yes, the latest estimate um, that's been done by the International Organization on Migration is about 370,000 people still in camps, though um, that number is actually debated. 
But at any rate, the people that have left those camps um, have often left them due to forced evictions. They've been handed sums um, that, as Melinda underlined, are really not enough to find adequate uh, lodging. And more, than, more importantly, there is very little adequate lodging available. So it's not clear where these people are going. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the spokespeople of the IOM suggested that they are just uh, hitching up tents on mountainsides, uh, a lot of these people. So I don't think we can really talk about a huge triumph in terms of uh, there being less people in camps now. Um, in other areas, uh, yes, there's uh, a great deal of rubble removal that's been done. That's really the first step in the reconstruction process, I think. Uh, what is happening with the reconstruction? As I said before, we're seeing very, very little, uh, except in the way of, of temporary shelter and temporary buildings and so on. Uh, so, you know, there are uh, some uh, avenues to go forward. and. You know, I really hope that we can avoid being in the same position next year talking about the same gloomy situation. If we can all work collectively to avoid that happening, it would be great. Um, and I'm going to focus, you know, the U.S. Um, is just one donor of many. Um, and, and of course, you know, they don't have all the blame, but we are here in Washington, D.C. And we're speaking to policymakers here, and hopefully we can make a difference. So I would like to focus on uh, USAID and what they've been doing. And, you know, there are some clear ways forward. In fact, there is U.S. aid forward. Uh, it's the reform program uh, that's been announced where uh, U.S. aid is uh, attempting to implement some really important um, reforms, some modernization, where, for instance, they're going, they're seeking more direct support of uh, country systems, so more local procurement, more work with local institutions, and so on. Uh, they're also seeking to strengthen um, uh, monitoring and evaluation mechanisms and transparency. So these are very commendable goals, uh, which we applaud. But so far, at least in the case of Haiti, very little of this is happening. Uh, there's very little local procurement. In terms of direct contracts from USAID, uh, there's only 1.3% that's going to Haitian organizations. When we look at the overall picture of contracts and grantees, it's about 1% of a billion uh, dollars that's going to Haiti. So that's, that's really very, very little, people agree. Um, and uh, then I'd like to focus a little bit on transparency. This is really a key issue. Um, and there's a lot of lip service that's uh, being given to transparency. We've seen a lot of fact sheets come from USAID and so on. But do we really know where the money is going in Haiti? Um, ultimately, we don't. Um, so a lot of the funds that USAID channels towards Haiti work goes to um, big private beltway contractors like uh, Tremonics. Uh, they've received about $170 million since the earthquake. And uh, these companies, when you try to get some sort of information from them on where the money is being used uh, in Haiti, if it's being spent locally, if it's going to local organizations and so on, uh, we tend to get the response that they can't reveal it because it's proprietary information. Uh, this is the blanket response uh, that we receive. And, and we don't know really what the concrete projects are very often or what their real targets are. Um, so it's very, very difficult to assess what's going on on the ground. Um, and, you know, there's a real problem of oversight as well. Uh, USAID itself lacks a real capacity for oversight of a lot of the work the contractors are doing. And this is something that they say themselves. Uh, their inspector general in uh, inspector general's reports um, on the aid efforts in Haiti have underlined the fact that there is a real problem of oversight uh, by USAID of the uh, projects that are being carried out. And there's a real problem of public access. Um, so USAID, unfortunately, to this day, really maintains a culture of secrecy around uh, its activities. Uh, so just recently, the Associated Press published a long investigative piece on what's uh, going on in Haiti, and they, they had very little to really say because they couldn't get that information. And what was interesting is that they were told that USAID itself was telling contractors and grantees not to share specific information on their projects in Haiti. That seems like a real shame. Um, and then we ourselves have been trying through FOIA a direct request to USAID to uh, receive data, to receive more data. And, um, you know, apparently in one of these emails that went to the wrong person and so on, we discovered that uh, what had been said is that our organization uh, should not receive this information because we write sometimes negative things about USAID. 
So we really don't think that the policy, this policy um, of opacity is uh, going to improve the aid effort in Haiti. Um, USAID needs to open up the books. These private contractors need to open up the books so that Haitians on the ground uh, and independent uh, observers can really get a, an opportunity to monitor the, the aid efforts. And, you know, that's the really only the, the only way to do it. I mean, this is why USAID forward itself as this as a principle of its efforts to modernize uh, USAID is that you need transparency, you need outside input if you're really going to correct um, a flawed, uh, the flawed methods that may exist. Uh, and, you know, Representative Yvette Clark said it very eloquently, um, but unfortunately I don't have to put on it, but I did, but hopefully I can share that with you later. Um, she she uh, has been a real champion on uh, these this effort to get more accountability and transparency around the aid efforts uh, in Haiti. Um, so I think what we really need to do is press for the application of USAID forward in Haiti. We need to see this happen. We need to see more uh, support to country systems. We need to see more um, transparency. That's a formidable task. Uh, because uh, you know you have some powerful interests. These uh, Beltway contractors that I mentioned are organized in a consortium, and they lobby Congress very heavily uh, to prevent USAID forward from being implemented, and especially the provisions that I've mentioned. Um, but I think you know if we all put our heads together and we make a real effort and uh, we get um, really the word out about the importance of USAID forward, we can help move it ahead. And there's also important legislation like the HERE Act introduced by Representative Congress, which has some really good transparency provisions uh, that can be helpful as well. And I'll just speak briefly now around the accountability of MINUSTA, and there's already been a lot said, so it'll be very brief. Um, you know, basically MINUSTA's been there for eight years, and we have to ask ourselves for what? What have they accomplished? And I'd like to just talk about accountability, about what they're not doing, about what they are doing. Um, and what they're not doing, at least at the current moment, is really improving the security situation in Haiti. It's been growing worse uh, in recent months. And of course, their claim to legitimacy at this point is to bring more stability and security uh, to Haiti, uh, notably by strengthening uh, the Haitian National Police. But the numbers of Haitian National Police remain very low. Um, and over the course of eight years, one would have thought that more would have been trained. We need about double the number at least, according to some of the experts. Um, there's also a need for accountability around what uh, MINUSTA has been doing, um, and unfortunately. Uh, it's been engaged in a lot of human rights abuses. Uh, there have been various in incidents of alleged uh, rape, of arbitrary killings and other abuses that have been committed by uh, foreign troops. Uh, there's very, very little accountability around this. Invariably, offending troops are shipped off to their countries where, in general, uh, they, I mean, they're not subject to Haitian laws and they get, uh, you know, very little judicial action against uh, their misdeeds in Haiti in their countries. And then, of course, cholera has been mentioned. And uh, yes, cholera remains a real problem in Haiti. Uh, the numbers did go down, but they're still way too high. There were over 300, 300 dead uh, over the summer. It was an exceptionally dry season when we don't expect to have many um, cholera cases, but it's certainly been continu continuing. And now with um, Tropical Storm Isaac, it was a tropical storm when it hit Haiti, uh, you have had a lot of flooding, and it's led to a big rise in cholera. In fact, there's been a 250 percent rise uh, in 20 days uh, since Tropical Storm Isaac. So it's a real problem, and I don't think we can really be triumphant about what's been done to address the cholera situation in the country. So the, the way forward, I mean, you need some real um, accountability to be mandated, and there's a, an opportunity to do that. The United Nations Security Council uh, is going to be putting forward a resolution to renew uh, Venusta's mandate very soon. Yep, just finishing up. Okay, and uh, they, the UN Secretary General has been talking about the need for a timeline uh, for withdrawal. So that's a step forward that had not occurred before, and hopefully we're going to see in this resolution a very firm timeline with very firm uh, benchmarks, um, and also an acknowledgement of the problems that have occurred. There's been no acknowledgement by MINUSTA of these human rights abuses 
or of the cholera problem. So these are two things uh, that definitely we would like to see this upcoming resolution will be coming out of the UN Security Council uh, towards the beginning of October. Thank you. Appreciate it very much, but uh, we have the congressman here, and it's important that he have a statement and he has to move on to other things. So, would you please now welcome our host, the honorary host, the honorary host. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Ron Daniels, the Honorable Dr. Ron Daniels, Institute of the Black World. This is his third year in moderating the Haiti panel. Let's give him a round of applause. And to the six panelists, uh, I intend to uh, review your remarks uh, very much, and I'm so proud to have all of you there. Here, there's something I could say about all of you. Uh, I have uh, three people that have uh, helped prepare me for this weekend. Uh, one, so happens that they're all lawyers. Uh, Cynthia Martin, my chief of staff, attorney Michael Darner, my legislative director, and Attorney Bert Wives, who worked with me, and he's now uh, very, very much involved in our uh, 42nd annual Black Caucus event. Would all three of you stand up and take a bow, please? <laughs> now, here's what I, uh, I'm gonna submit my remarks for the record. Uh, we have gone over many of the issues, but the final question, uh, moderator Daniels, is what are we to do about this? Where do we go from here? Uh, and I want uh, all of you to make recommendations because uh, I think we haven't made our case forcefully enough with the United Nations. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, because I have the uh, friendship of the former First Lady of the, of the White House, Hillary Clinton, now the Secretary of State, uh, I think that uh, we can uh, make some very specific recommendations coming out of uh, this annual Haiti Forum. And last of all, uh, the president I've known longer and better before any of the other presidents that I've known since John F. Kennedy, uh, the 44th president of the United States, Barack Obama, I think uh, can form, and he's got a number of people in the White House, and one that was in the White House, that will all be working with them. And, and that's basically, uh, taking your ideas and the discussion that will follow uh, is what I plan to do uh, from now on. There is only one more day left in Congress uh, before uh, the uh, November 6th election. Uh, we will be working on this throughout, and I, uh, I will want all of you to stay in touch so that we, when we get uh, any of these meetings set up, I would, I would like to be able to invite those of you who might be able to attend. Uh, with that, I will ask to be excused for a telephone call uh, with, uh, with the, Black, uh, the Michigan Black Chamber of Commerce and the Ford Motor Company and in terms of uh, uh, events that will be going on, and I will be right back. Thank you very, very much. Good to be here. Congressman's pretty sharp, and then I got one of those devil breasted suits myself. <laughs> 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 right. We elected to uh, have a victorious primary, and, you know,
you know, it starts getting more spiffy. It used to come out just a little bit. You know, it's interesting. Well, we're now in a very crucial part of the program, and uh, let me say as moderator, there is always an interesting tension between those who are part of government and who represent government and those who seek to hold government accountable. And by the way, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. That is, in fact, a part of the democratic process. Frederick Douglass said, power can seize nothing without a demand. And yet, those who are in power, you know, and when I'm in organizations where I'm facing dissent, I feel uncomfortable too, because I mean, you, there's almost a natural tendency to just kind of want to have it your way. You know, this thinks the president is running, Military Authorization Act, Guantanamo is still open. I, you know, we got some voices raising up against that. Doesn't mean I'm opposed to President Obama, but on those issues, I want him to hear my voice. And I'm saying that deliberately because this ought to be about dialogue an exchange of ideas and, and not antagonism. And quite frankly, I'm not, I've heard a very civil raising of concerns about certain issues. And what I'd like to do is just raise two or three of them, particularly for um, Joelle and for um, Beth to, to respond to very quickly. And that is, number one, could we get a sense of just how much of the aid that was not only by the United States, but is there a sense of the composite, but right? how much has, has been allocated and how much is still in the pipeline? That's one question. The second question is has to do with the question of what is the U.S. position on the prosecution of Duvalier, which was, was raised. Uh, and then finally, this was sort of touched on, and that is the issue of uh, reconstitution of the military. Um, that has not been talked about as, as well. I mean, there are many other issues, but I, w I would just, those were sort of, sort of stood out for perhaps your commentary or comments. Sure. Um, well, let me take the um, question on uh, uh, pipeline in terms of what was committed and, and where we are now. I, I actually don't have the figures for the international community. The UN keeps that they have an office that we, you know, we feed our numbers into them and they collect it with um, all of the other donor um, data. And so I would have to refer you to that office, um, or I could send that to you, I could find it myself and send it to you. From the USG perspective, we pledged uh, a little over, I believe it was $3.1 million. Uh, $1.3 billion of that amount has already been spent, and that was all for humanitarian assistance. Uh, $1.8 billion is for long-term uh, development assistance programs. And of that amount, about um, 700 million of it, a little, bit, uh, a little bit less than half, has been committed. So that's kind of where we are. Um, and some say, well, you know, why hasn't it all been you know, spent? And that's because this is a long-term proposition, rebuilding Haiti, and so it's not as if we ever intended to spend all of that money within the first uh, two to three years. Uh, Haiti, as has been discussed, is a desperately poor country, uh, it's very weak institutions, and there's an absorption capacity uh, problem there as well. And so we want to be sure that the money that we do invest there um, will get the results that are required, which means doing a certain amount of institution building before we can then get into um, a, a lot of the longer term uh, development goals of this agency. I'll leave the other questions to Joe. Um, I, I, I will answer the, the other two questions, but on the point that um, Beth just made, uh, this is going to be a recurring theme that I'm going to come back to over and over again, which is that the ability of Haiti to succeed in the effort that, is, that the Haitian people have undertaken requires that the government and the people of Haiti achieve this on their own with our assistance. So it may be very easy to say that all of this money that has been pledged to Haiti is not being spent fast enough. But I would submit that until the government of Haiti and the people of Haiti have the mechanism to be able to absorb that money, to be able to spend it on the things that they have decided they would like to spend it on, it becomes very difficult to do it otherwise because we will then be back to the same situation we have been back over the many years, which is that the international community will swoop in, will do things for Haiti, 
will leave, and then the people of Haiti will find themselves in a similar situation, and we will we, we start the cycle over again. We see an opportunity now to change that. Now, as for the other two questions, I'll take the easiest one first, which is the military. Um, the, the fact is that and we're all familiar that President Martelli has a campaign to that he made during uh, his presidential campaign that he believed, and he also believed not only himself, but that the people of Haiti were interested in seeing the return of an army in Haiti. And he laid out the way this army, or this new home forces, as he called it, would be developed. Our position in discussions with the president and his, and his government and parliamentarians, and I think this has been well accepted uh, across the board in Haiti, is that at this current time, Haiti's challenges are very great. One of them is security, and there's one that can be addressed by helping develop the Haitian National Police, helping develop institutions in Haiti that are strong, comes from orders. <laughs> really cares about Haiti. Um, the, uh, so on the military, I, I, I believe we are in a situation right now, as the US government is in its relationship with the government of Haiti, that it is not a priority for the government of Haiti. It is not an issue of current discussion. Yes, it's true that there is a Ministry of Defense, and there is a Minister of Defense who has been traveling throughout the hemisphere, working to develop uh, our arrangements with uh, other neighbor countries, uh, I don't believe he has had much success um, because we all share the same objective that Haiti security needs certainly can come in from a different uh, angle. And as I said, it's the Haitian National Police and its institutions. As for former President Jovanil, there is probably no one in this room that is more passionate about this situation whose family has suffered under Jovanil as mine did. So this is an issue that is very dear and close to me and something that I'm very focused on. But the fact is, the government of Haiti is the government of Haiti. It is a sovereign nation that has developed its own institutions. The process has been undertaken in Haiti through the judicial system, where a, a weak judicial system, system admittedly, one with whom we have shared expertise in order to help develop the capacity that it needs to be able to prosecute any and all cases that involves human rights um, uh, uh, abuses to, to the people of Haiti, whether now, in the past, or in the future. And we'll continue to do that. And I suppose at a certain time, the government of Haiti, the people of Haiti, will feel that they have the capability to take on cases, which the case of President Duvalier is going to be a very high visibility case. It's going to be a very um, uh, fragile is going to be it's going to be a traumatic experience for the people of Haiti, and they are going to have to make the choice as to when it is that they feel that they are capable of taking that on. But until that time, we will do our part, which is to provide them, and we are doing this on a daily basis with all of the assistance to develop those institutions, whether it's the police, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the, the lawyers, whether it's civil society's understanding of some of these things that need to be addressed so that the people of Haiti can move forward and put this experience behind them. At that point, when the people of Haiti are ready for it, we'll be right there as a partner with them to give them the possibility to do it correctly. Okay, I'd like to, I'd like to now introduce, uh, as was suggested, no greater friend of Haiti than uh, the woman I'm about to introduce, he is a battler and a fighter, both internationally and domestically. Would you please now welcome Congresswoman Maxine Walker. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me first thank Ron Daniels for his consistency in organizing for and about Haiti. He has always made sure that when we hold the Black Caucus Legislative Conference Weekend that there's some time set apart for Haiti and these meetings are put together and we have the opportunity to interact with all of our specialists and people who care so much about Haiti and I'd like to thank Ron Daniels. Would you give him a <laughs> thank you. That's for John Congress, who is uh, 
just one of a kind, a very special man, uh, a legislator who has led for so many years on issues that other people wouldn't touch. He's always been a friend to Haiti. His staff has always been directed to pay attention, uh, to help educate, and even though he's not here today, we must know and understand that he has been the leader for so long on this issue. Give him a round of applause. Right. Let me just say that I wanted to try and come by today and spend a few minutes uh, to talk about some issues that I think we all must be concerned about as it relates to Haiti. First, uh, let us be very, very clear. We all love Haiti and we want the best for Haiti. And so we must be concerned, not simply about whether or not we can do temporary donations of food and uh, those kinds of items. And we have churches that, of course, help out with the organizing and the support of schools and all that's good. But I have said once before and I say now that we need to stand with Haiti in support of governance. And until we get the governance right, nothing will follow. Governance simply means the institutions, as we're being alluded to, are strengthened and that they work, and they work in ways that uh, will benefit the people. So today, let me just stir it up a little bit and say, that uh, there have been some protests going on in Haiti. And those protests are happening because of a number of issues uh, that have been identified. Uh, and let me try and just share with you what I understand and what I know. Uh, before I talked about uh, their protests, I found it very interesting that Mr. Martelle, President Martelle, and Andy Appan are fighting. That's good. Uh, that's good for a whole lot of reasons. Number one, Mr. Andy Apey has had his way for so long. He organized the group of 184 that was responsible for the overthrow and the coup d'etat of uh, President Aristide. He has uh, been in control of uh, his businesses and I dare say there's been some exploitation and other kinds of things on and on and on. So if he is being stopped, and he's not able to travel in the way that he has been able to travel in before, maybe I will chalk that up to um, one thing that Mr. Martelli has done that may be very good for everybody. Now, having said that, this government issue, first of all, the elections. We are operating, I suppose, with 20 members of the Senate and 10 who should be elected. We don't have a, um, an election council that is completed because in order to complete that uh, election council, the Senate has to, along with the other parliamentarians, I believe, they have to vote for their three that would make up nine to complete the panel. And so if you don't have, you're missing 10. Uh, it is hard to move forward. However, if you don't move forward, then you have to raise the question, how are we ever going to have the elections if we can't get the panel of nine? But as I understand it, in the Constitution, there is a way by which this can be done. And the way that this is done is the civil society is brought in, you bring in the unions, you bring in the churches, the religious community, and all of that. And then you would have the administration with one vote, justice with one vote. You'd end up with three kind of coming out of there and the other six coming out of all this formation. But the only way that will happen is the president has to make it happen. This is what I'm told. The president must help to organize and bring all of these organizations together in order that they come up with their representatives to serve on the election council so we can have elections. You can't have a democracy without elections. It does not work. And so I would hope, and I will talk to the Black Caucus, that we will all support the idea that the Constitution provides for a way by which to get this panel if, in fact, you have a situation like you have now where the Senate is not complete. And that must move forward. And that is the responsibility of President Martelet. 
And so we have to come out of here, uh, Congressman, with a resolution in support of elections, in support of the organizing of the um, of the panel of the what is it, CP? CP in the way that the Constitution says that it can be done so that we can move forward. That's number one. Number two, you know, all of this writing about the fact that people are still in tents and with the rains, what happened and how bad off it is and all of that, these land issues, President Preval came up with a way by which basically to do eminent domain and to acquire land so that land can be developed so we can develop this housing. And so that has not been dealt with. It has not, they have not moved forward. And whether the issue is who owns the land and whether or not uh, you can trace the title or whether we just have people who don't want housing built on the land unless they are part of the development and can reap some benefits. Whatever the reason is, we cannot continue to talk about those poor people in tents and the rains are coming again and the storms are coming again, all those poor people. We have to be strong enough to support the fact that the government must take leadership on acquiring the land that is necessary to do the development. The money is there and we've got to do that. And I would hope we'd come out with a resolution from this meeting because everybody knows now that we meet and we talk. But let's come out with some resolutions now. One, I'm asking for a resolution on support of the elections in the way that I've alluded to and we'll have a specific language for that. The other is on moving forward with uh, the acquisition of land. Even if you talk about eminent domain, people get a fair market value. Uh, if it's a title issue, it has to be worked through. But we've got to get people into permanent housing. That's it. This is just a shame and it's an embarrassment. It is horrible. And we've got to support the idea that we can get this done. The other thing is this. As we try to support how to build institutions, we know that Haiti is a sovereign nation, of course, and we respect that. And we cannot tell them how to run their government and how not to run their government. But we can attach some demands to the money that we give. And it's about time that we do more of that. Time that we do more of that. And I want to tell you, if you have a parliament, and they have a budgetary process, and they are determining how that budget is supposed to be spent, and if they say this money is to go to agriculture, where people can have money for seeds and you know everything that you need in order to grow and develop food, and if you have a budget for sports, and that budget is supposed to go towards sports, if you organize a separate commission, and that commission is then given the opportunity to undermine the work of the budget, and the money is placed in the hands with someone other than the parliamentarians or the minister of finance, et cetera, et cetera, you're undermining the democracy. It just won't work. And I know that Agriculture is extremely important. And Mrs. Martelle must, may have all of the expertise you need in knowing something about agriculture. But I think one of the things we have to encourage is follow the work of the parliament. If the parliament has identified how that money is going to be spent, you can't just organize a commission and give that money to a commission and put somebody over it who's not elected and then they go out and spend the money and they can use the commission to go and raise more money and that's happening both we know in agriculture and sports. The other thing is this, we appreciate to USAID for building some housing. I understand they have about 5,000 planned in an area that I can't remember the name of. I think it starts with a, a C. But I understand they're no bigger than a cracker box and that uh, they're not conducive to you know, quality living for the average Haitian family. We have to say to the USAID that Haitians have to be involved in the development of these homes. They have to talk about what their design should be. They should talk about what they want. And if USAID is not respecting that, 
we in the Congress of the United States are going to have to do something about that. It is not fair and it's not right. And I want to welcome you to my next meeting. Yeah, three resolutions now. Because here's what I want. I want that this gathering is so significant and so important that we come out in support of strong governance. We come out in support of the people of Haiti. We come out in support of Haiti doing and being everything that it can be. And let me just say to people who get worried that I may look as if I'm criticizing Marte Lea a little bit. We support whomever is going to deal with Haiti in ways that we know it needs to be dealt with. We have said, okay, there are some people who said, well, the way that Martele was elected or appointed or supported by this government, we beyond that. He is the president. We support the president until the president tells us in the way that he acts, we can't support him anymore. And if, in fact, they're undermining the budget, if, in fact, commissions are being established to get around the parliament, if, in fact, there's no commitment to setting up the CEP so we can have elections, then we're going to have some problems with Mr. Martelli. And you can tell, because they always go back and tell me, you know what Maxine Waters said. Well, I'm only saying this. We support the president as long as the president deserves our support. We're not against him, but we recognize the people in the street for some reason. The people are protesting and they understand what is going on and what is not going on. Let us not go back and go backwards with him. Let us make sure that we send a strong message. We don't want the military, as you have said. There's no reason that people should be walking around in uniforms and taking over police stations and, you know, the old Duvalier crowd getting back in. And people who are identified in certain positions where they are being pointed out as folks who have been problematic, whether it's Guy Philippe or other folks, we have to point that out and say to Mr. Martelle, Mr. Martelle, you're endangering your support from the USA if you, in fact, are bringing those people back into government and placing them in places where they now have the power to go back and do what we have been working so hard to undo all of these years. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's my message. And I told them that I would hope that they would be able to participate. We were thinking that this was going to take place tomorrow. And then, of course, we learned that it's, it was taking place today. And I did not have time to work on the resolutions that I wanted to bring to you so that you could consider them. But these resolutions, the wording for them will follow. Uh, did everybody understand what I was trying to explain with these resolutions? We're going to fight for him. We want to work with the president. 
But like I said, if in fact those issues that you know I've addressed, particularly the election issues, are not addressed, uh, that gives us no choice but to uh, to criticize that and to be against you know what we think is undermining of democracy. So uh, having said that, Ron Daniels, again, I thank you so much. And if the resolutions that I have alluded to, I gave you the uh, the main template of that. If your group is in agreement with us developing those resolutions and passing them, I would like to know because I'd like to move forward and bring it to you. Would the House so, so indicate that we have a yay? Yay! yay. 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 The USAID houses are being developed in the Caracol area. Yeah. The little cracker boxes. Yeah. All right, <laughs> we're going to be dealing with that. Before we go to the audience, I wanted to ask Mario one question along these lines. Because I took note of the fact that when you opened your commentary, you started with the positive. In other words, you started with a, an example of what you thought was going right, and then you laid out some issues. Now, I guess my question, Mario, is there active dialogue between the human rights community in Haiti and the current government? Are you in dialogue? Is there an interchange, or is it strictly a kind of adversarial relationship? En réalité, il y a un dialogue parce que faut nous poser une question claire. Est-ce qu'il y a une démocratie en Haïti ou bien pas Je vais répondre à cette question avec un peu d'émotion parce que c'est quelque chose qui me touche. Et pour être honnête, je pense qu'il n'y a vraiment pas de dialogue. Et part de ça, c'est parce que nous nous posons la question est-ce qu'il y a une démocratie en Haïti ou pas moi-même, généralement, je dois lire, je écrit, et la Commission américaine de l'OAMON, pour que nous dénonçons, de manière systématique, la venue des RIA, et différentes violations de l'OAMON que le gouvernement a été fait. J'ai personnellement récemment écrit une lettre à l'Interamérique Commission sur les droits humains, et il y a des copies dans le bas, dénonçant certaines des violations des droits humains sous la nouvelle administration. Et il est clair pour nous, et en tant qu'avocat des fonds de loi, c'est un gouvernement dictatorial qui a dirigé Haïti pour l'Iran. C'est clair pour nous, en tant qu'organisation, en tant qu'organisation, que c'est un dictatorial de gouvernement qui a été mené à Haïti. Et nous ne comprenons plus bien, genre, on peut se mettre, et Maxime Sotilda là, au fur et à mesure que nous avons fait des protestations, le gouvernement a fait plus de bons salariés, plus d'atrocités. Uh, we'll start to understand this better because, as uh, Representative Waters mentioned, the people are starting to take to the streets, and we'll soon see that as that happens, the government will, will respond with the process. So, again, yes, bon, generally, we're not talking about democracy. The definition classic for democracy is separation of power. It's not existing. We've talked a lot today about democracy, and one of the fundamental principles of democracy is the separation of the three powers and that doesn't exist in Haiti. I really just wanted to ask that but the answer is that there is no real dialogue on Haiti. Okay, okay. So that's what I need to I, I, I will finish. I will finish. Là, dans la salle, il y a des journalistes, il y a des des bagages qui pouvent en Haiti, même avec le Sénat, pas de bon, pas de rapport du tout, au contraire. C'est vassalisation de de chambre non même que mes matériels. Uh, and here we've got some journalists, we've got senators, and it's great to have this kind of discussion, but the reality is on the ground in Haiti, it's the vassalization, the parliament has been vassalized. And there should be dialogue between the three powers of government, but there isn't three powers. Bon, alors, si il y a trois pouvoirs, nous n'avons pas forcé faire dialogue, 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 nous n'avons pas forcé faire dans l'interférence, dans la situation en Haïti. Et donc, si vous avez trois 
powers, you can have, you can force dialogue, but you have a situation of the executive always interfering in the other branches. Donc, et pas de dialogue et entre personnes et entre gouvernement, pouvoir eux-mêmes et pouvoir avec ce décision là. And so there's there's no dialogue either between the three powers or between the government and uh, in uh, civil society. C'est à commencement. Okay, here's what we're going to do That's now. We're really out of time. Do we have to really leave the room now? Or do we have... Do you yes. want maybe 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Okay, we're going to take three, one, two, three. Raise your questions and then we have the panel answer. Make it short and precise. One, two, three. Hi, my name is Michelle Austin Patty. I'm an attorney in Miami, Florida, Haitian American. And I'm concerned about certain things. In particular, I'd like to follow up on Alexander. Means comments regarding the procurement situation with one point X percent being local. I'm interested in finding out here it's jobs that's the issue, in Haiti it's the same issue. Absolutely. We could talk about everything else. What are we doing about job creation? Because by procuring in Haiti, then you'd have employers being able to hire others. What are you doing with US dollars in funding in Haiti with regards to economic development in the true sense, which is job creation? Okay, that's question one. What's the next? That, that's uh, this hand and this hand. You're number two. Go yes. Right here. My name is Margaret Shiva, and my statement goes to the attorney on the panel. I wondered if you might expand on the agreement between, uh, the immunity agreement between Haiti and the U.S. Okay. Thank you. All right, and finally, my friend yes. Will. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a coordinator of the D.C. chapter of Women's International League for Peace and, Peace and Freedom. We're supporting the uh, people that are trying to get accountability at the UN. My question is about MINUSCA. I have two different versions among the panelists. One, um, Mr. Danny said uh, we'll target by 2016, if, 2016, if there's enough of a Haitian security force development. And on the other panelist, Mr. Mays, is it? Um, me. me. Said um, he hopes the UN will focus on a target date and some accomplishments, but I'd like to hear something a little more specific. My information is that people want the news to out now yes. or yesterday. Okay, yes. but, right, we'll get an answer to those questions yes. and expeditiously short answers because we have five minutes. That means each of you have about a minute to respond and then we're out. Who takes the first question on job generation? Yeah, yes. I'd like to do that. Thank you very much for the question because that's a, you're absolutely right. Um, yes, ha Haiti needs houses, but just as importantly, if not more importantly, they need jobs so that they can pay for those houses or pay for those rents uh, and, and have an independent life going forward. And so um, we are very much focused on that. In fact, since the earthquake, we have provided um, or sourced uh, 400 local firms for various things. So we are increasing our, our local procurement rapidly. Uh, we've also um, contracted uh, with a local firm to work with other Haitian organizations that want to apply for USAID resources to help them build the financial systems they need to order in order to account for US government funding. So we are very, very interested in moving USAID forward in Haiti and increasing by a substantial amount the amount of money that we put through local institutions. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a bridge agreement for one year extension of our major health program. Our health program provides basic health services to 50% of the Haitian population. In a year's time, we want to put all of that money into the Ministry of Health so that the Ministry of Health can then have the ownership for that health delivery system. So we're working very carefully with um, groups of auditors and financial analysts and planning uh, people so that we can build, along with the World Bank, we're, co we're financing this so that we can build the institutional strength of the Ministry of Health to account for those dollars. Okay, um, we, need, we, we really need to move on, but let me just intervene here to say the issue of transparency or or ability to get information, yeah. would you quickly speak to that? Yeah, I would say, you know, our, our administrator likes to talk about his push for extreme transparency. We have signed the international um, a transparency initiative which commits USAID to publish what we fund. We have created a USA dashboard that puts that financial information out there for public to see. Uh, we have uh, worked with the um, Haitian Advocacy Working Group to provide uh, reports. We have uh, 
put a list of all of the grants and contracts that we have awarded in Haiti into a document that has been um, uh, that has been publicly um, allotted. So I, you know, I have to say that I think we're moving fast and we're moving with. Uh, absolute conviction that we want to be transparent and we want to share information we have no reason not to and so we're a big cumbersome bureaucracy perhaps but we're getting there brian the question of the immunity of the u.n and the difficulties and complexities of uh, prosecuting the UN. yeah i've got a, it's a good question i've got a whole hard drive full of information on it but the quick answer is 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 the, the u.n mission in haiti like all u.n missions in the 60 years of peacekeeping Gets to, has a, a, something called a SOFA, Status of Forces Agreement, which regulates the rights and obligations of the UN mission. And one of the things that it does, one of the, the, the rights it has, is that it has protection from, from national courts. And there's a good reason behind that. The, the, it's possible that uh, harassment in a national court could prevent the organization from, from doing some of its important work. But there's also another provision, in the, in, in, and again, in every single Status of Forces Agreement that says the UN needs to set up an alternative mechanism that gives victims of peacekeeper malfeasance their day in court. And the UN has refused to do that second step. And, and our legal argument, which is one that it's never actually prevailed against the UN, but it's prevailing against other, it's prevailed against other international organizations with immunity agreements, and we think this is a case that's going to finally uh, open up accountability for the UN. Our argument is that those two, those two provisions are, need to be read together. That if the UN refuses to provide an alternative mechanism for justice for, for its victims, then national courts should refuse to, to enforce the immunity provision. Alexander, in clarifying, no, 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 no. Alexander, in clarifying the question of the UN mandate, because you spoke about that as well, uh, would you clarify the question for our um, yeah, assistant from Will? And, and, also, and, 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 and also, and you, you talked about the withdrawal, but would you also articulate what your prescription would be in terms of Minista? Minista, I'm sorry. Minista. Minista. Right, and I'd also like to confirm what um, the lady who asked the question was saying, which is that civil society in Haiti, um, from ever since Minista arrived, has been questioning their presence and uh, asking for uh, immediate withdrawal. We've got to remember that um, Manusta has, you know, very dubious legitimacy in Haiti. They first arrived uh, essentially to support a de facto regime um, coming out of the unconstitutional ou ouster of uh, President Aristide. So that was at least their initial uh, function. Uh, but at any rate, um, there is now talk of a timeline at the level of the UN that's coming from the UN Secretary General's office. They made a recommendation uh, to the UN Security Council, which is soon going to issue a resolution on the renewal of the mandate. Um, and so they've recommended that there be a, a specific timeline with very specific benchmarks um, associated with every phase of the withdrawal of the troops. Um, and in terms of, so he was suggesting four or five years or something along these lines. So we'll have to see if that shows up in, in the resolution. In terms of our prescription, I mean, uh, it's, you know, it's a halfway sort of step. I mean, obviously, Haitian civil society isn't going to be particularly satisfied, but it's a step forward in terms of uh, Minusta possibly withdrawing uh, in the near future. And uh, certainly, I think what we want to see is that if the benchmarks um, are not achieved in terms of strengthening uh, the capacity of the Haitian police and so on, then we need to find alternatives rather than uh, continuing to count on Minusta to carry out that training, uh, find other groups uh, and other methods to, to do that. Let's give our panel a big round of applause. Uh, thank you very, very much.